Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. Definitely a great show for you today. Our guest is into science and she's into applying it to help people live better. So you know I'm happy to have her on the show. She is a master's level biochemist and uh, she's the only human physics scientist that has focused her expertise to address our country's epidemic level health crisis and the mechanical causes of disease. That in and of itself is worth a podcast, I tell you folks. And in addition to directing the Restorative Exercise Institute in Ventura, California, she's also the producer and talent of Aligned and Well, the DVD line, as well as a bunch of cool stuff over with Guy Am's Restorative Exercise series. Katie Bowman stays busy, she stays balanced, and she's into the mechanical causes of disease. Katie, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. What is the mechanical causes of disease? Oh my gosh. Well, those are all the, um, you know, I think most people are used to thinking about the body as a, as the result, the health outcomes as a result of chemistry. But what I study is kind of the wear and tear, the physical Newtonian physics of what we do that breaks the body down. So the frictions, the pressures, um, the loads that you create through movement that affect what the, uh, DNA inside your nucleus does that's that's the kind of stuff that I look at. So wait, you're you're are you telling me that how I how I'm moving my body is changing my DNA? Yeah. How how you move kind of like you, you are what you eat, you're also what you move. So so tell me tell me about tell me about some of this research that that I'm moving what how how does moving does it help my DNA does it hurt my DNA what causes which? Well, it's not, I mean, it's not as specific as, I mean, the category is not really that I look at move yes or no. Obviously, in the, in the, the easiest way to look at it is if you move, you're usually better off than if you don't. But I look at what all the forces are doing, like gravity, for example, um, is a big thing where you're under the effect of gravity and that has a certain, uh, creates a certain effect within your body. So if we look at what the astronauts what their health what what are some of their health issues being in a zero gravity environment you know their bone density starts going down so so yeah your your cells are constantly adapting to the mechanical loads that you're placing on them and so i i don't i mean i work on the on the cellular level effect of movement so you can say hey couch potato hey athlete and there's going to be a difference between the two what i really look at is between the the same person doing small nuances of behavior. What's the difference between walking on the treadmill versus walking over ground? Like mm-hmm. you can really start evaluating movement with a lot more variables than what we're currently doing. And that's what I spend most of my time doing is educating people that movement is more than yes or no. There's actually different qualities of movement and variables to consider when you're trying to get a healthy outcome. We're certainly all about uh, eating uh, and food and exercise quality here on the show. So what what are some characteristics of high quality movement and some characteristics of low quality movement? Well, I mean, natural movement. So these are the movements that we've been doing for um, a long portion of the human timeline are movements that um, I, I, I don't usually like the term like you have movement requirements based on your DNA um, because your body is constantly adapting to whatever you do. That all being said is you have a certain amount of strength in all of your tissues that are required for you to do basic functional movements. Um, For example, you need the density in your hip to hold you up while you're standing and you're moving around. So the qualities that I'm looking at are how what's the loading frequency? Loading frequency is is a good one. Like what's enough? what's enough movement, what's too much movement, what's too little. So the, because there's, because loads are impossible to calculate, it's really easiest to just get mimic as many natural loads as you possibly can. And that would be, um, the weights that you're carrying around the joint angles that you're moving and then the frequency of which you're doing both. So with all, you walk into any modern gym and there are a plethora of machines, which 
are put you in movements that that do not exist outside of gyms is that a good thing or a bad thing well good or bad it's kind of like it's it's not as easy to say good or bad it's more to say like what's your desired outcome certainly the difference between not moving and moving at all there's always an inherent benefit to any sort of moving that you do um the biggest problem that humans have right now is using a very small range of their potential motions at a very high frequency so if if you just take a joint action in biomechanics and I'm a biomechanist so instead of a biochemist just in case anyone was was listening bio biochemist is a little bit different so bio biomechanics is the study of what are your joints doing so if you're sitting down all day say you're you know sitting at work you have a certain hip and knee position right you're sitting in a chair about 90 degrees in your hip 90 degrees in your knee but then you go to the gym your quote exercise time and then you kind of proceed to do things at which you're in that same 90 degree knee and hip flexion. So say you take a spin class or say you go on an elliptical machine or you're going to do weight machines, but you're sitting down on them. So what we're starting to look at is like, what, what is the biological tax of only using this small range of motion of the hip over and over and over again throughout? I mean, since you sat down and went to school, you've been doing the same thing. You'll do the same motion all the way until your final day, what is the ramification of never using anything else? And it's like, well, it's the knee replacements, it's the hip replacements, it's the cartilage wear and tear. So that's, that's the kind of, um, problem that we're, that we're trying to solve. Earlier, you made a wonderful analogy of people say you are what you eat and you were taking it and saying, well, you are a bit like you move. It sounds like there may be another parallel with the way people often talk about food, which is this, eat, eat, eat the rainbow and eat, eat a diversity of food. It sounds like what you're saying is uh, eat, eat, move like the rain, rainbow, do a lot of different movements. Is that fair? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great, it's a great way to look at it. I talk about, you know, we, we talk about junk food and, you know, junk food is not really a thing that brings you a robust health, but to someone who has no food, junk food certainly has a lot of beneficial properties. We can make a list of, well, it can get you, you know, short-term energy. Um, it can fill a void in your gut. It can occupy your, uh, satiate your mind or whatever. So there's always inherent good in everything. However, you can't, your, your cells aren't able to function, which means your body isn't able to sustain itself on a purely junk food diet. So, we know that there's this whole food, that there's all these qualities of food that are great, and you've got macro and micronutrients. You also have the age of the food, you know, is another variable that's not, that's mostly um, in the last 10 years that people are really focusing on. How was, how was the food that you're eating? How was it developed? Was it developed in the presence of chemicals or not? So there's all these other influences, and the same thing goes goes for movement so that there's just like there's whole or real food. There's also whole or real movement and your body is really most compatible. If longevity is your primary, um, objective. And for a lot of people, you know, who are performance athletes, their, their primary objective is not longevity, but I would say most people are exercising because they do want sustainable health or to be able to move for a long period of time. So you definitely need the full spectrum of nutrition that you can gather through movement. Ooh, I, I, let's let's keep the analogies going. I'm getting. I, I love. <laughs> go, I love. I love goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps because I love analogies. I also do love goosebumps. The the <laughs> so the whole foods movement, obviously a, a wonderful movement, a movement that a lot of people are rallying behind. What is the whole movement? Move it, movement. <laughs> I didn't think about that before I said it. What is the whole movement movement? What would you be doing to live that lifestyle? Well, um, oh, it's just, it's so big. It's so big. The whole, it's, 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 it's whole. The whole. It's the whole. <laughs> I mean, it's, it'd be like asking you, hey, Jonathan, could you in a two minutes explain everything that I need to be eating? And you would have to sit there and list all of the nutrients because um, you, the, it's the, it has to do mostly with everything, all of the movements that you would have done sans any modern convenience. So if you look around and you're like, okay, I'm going to get up today. Well, the first thing you do is you get out of your bed, you know, that's a foot and a half or two feet off of the ground. So already just by getting up out of your bed, instead of getting up of sleeping off the floor, you've already missed a whole range of motion and knee and hip flexion. You already missed one rep 
of something that you would have done every single day of your life. And if I took you through an hour of living in modern convenience, you would see that objectively, if we put little goniometers, which is a fancy way of saying um, an angle measurement in every single one of your joints and EMGs all over your muscles, that the difference between one hour in the way we live our lives now to the way we would live our lives were there nothing would be huge. The difference between whole food and junk food is nothing compared the diff between the difference between whole food and junk food movement. If we're going to quantify it, it's it's mind blowing. It is it is just the loads and what you're missing out on are huge. And I don't want people to think that I'm talking about even just basic health, like the shape of your body, literally that it's in right now. I'm not talking about the figurative shape, the literal shape that you have to your bones are are a result of how you've moved throughout your life. So, you know, like they say, when you have a newborn baby, you don't lay it on its back for too long because its head kind of flattens out because the bones are shaping based on the loads they're experiencing. All of us, our, our whole shape of our body is different than how it would have been, which is just really, I think, profound. Of course, I'm totally biased in the profoundness of it all. <laughs> but I do find it to be profound because so many people are struggling with health, health issues um, that are just a result of not – of of for some reason, movement kind of became downgraded as not as essential as things like eating and breathing, but it is, it's just as essential. Well, and then, so what, what do we do? I mean, I, I, I like you, I get, I get excited about the science. Like it's amazing. It's great. Like you are what you move. Uh, however, many of us might like myself, I have to sit at a desk for 12 sure. hours a day. Like that's just, that's how I live. Right. So what, what can I do to not have junk movement and what, what can our listeners do to not have junk movement given the constraints of modern life? Yeah, well, I mean, there, that's a, the cool thing is because the gap between the two is so huge, any small change that you make usually has like these profound changes on health. So, you know, you've probably seen a lot of like the standing workstation suggestion. You know, you have to, if you're going to be on your computer, and I, you know, I participate in modern living just like anyone else. <laughs> I'm on my computer a lot, but in, I don't sit at a desk. Um, I stand at a counter or a standing workstation, or because I have a laptop, I'll sit on the floor. So, so say you're going to spend four to five hours on your computer. There's nothing that says you have to keep your body static while you do it. You know, you have the option of, of changing that around. Even if you um, <clears throat> got a, a desk that had a standing option or, you know, for a lot of people, it's like putting a box on the top of your desk and standing up. <laughs> the other one is like walking, you know, walking is, you know, maybe as terms of frequency, what humans did the most as far as the highest loads and the most frequent uh, joint configurations that you would cycle through. So most people are kind of have stopped walking where historically it's calculated that humans have walked an average of about a thousand miles a year. So if you're going to do, you know, if you break it down into per day, that's, I think it's like 2.75, somewhere between two and three quarters and three miles a day. So a lot of times the kind of the reflex is, okay, what, what do hunter, hunter gatherers is where a lot of the natural movement information comes from. And there's modern hunter gatherers on the planet right now. So we have all these measures of um, things like their bone health and their osteoarthritis. And we know the frequencies in which they move. And we know our incidences and we know how much we move. We can quantify that pretty well. The mistake is to go, okay, well, if they walk 9,000 or, or say they walk, you know, an average of a thousand miles a year, which is about three miles a day, what we tend to do is go, okay, that's three miles a day. I can do that. And that's great because if you were walking zero to bump up your mileage is awesome. But then there's this whole other thing going, they don't walk three miles a day. Some days they walk one, some days they walk five, some days they walk 12, some days or for two days or three days in a row, they walk zero. So it really is understanding this whole concept of variability, the fact that variab variability is the backbone to human adaptation. And so the less you vary, the um, less physical reward something gives you. Um, and then also just to, to I try to, to like have people not think about the term exercise. So term exercise is also kind of a, a modern equivalent to saying, you know what? You don't have time to eat all day, so I would like you to eat a daily requirement of 2,000 words over a period of 45 minutes, or 2,000 calories over a period of 45 minutes. Mm. 
So the ramifications of these, like, I got to go out and do this huge bout of exercise for 45 minutes to get my heart rate up and, you know, whatever. That's also not really the way the body works optimally. So you could, you could even take your requirement of, you know, somewhere between three and eight miles that you're going to do a few times a week and break it up. Like it's just as good to go for a 10 minute walk seven or eight times a day as it is to go walk for an hour and 20 minutes. And this, this is in terms of the uh, impact that has on your genetic expression or, or like, is, is that specific to the, like, I guess, what is the goal? Does, Cause you mentioned like athletes have a different goal than someone who's sure. just after longevity. Sure. So this is after like, if you're just after general longevity. Well, I mean, not, not just general longevity. I mean, it's about, it's robust health. Gotcha. Gotcha. Like you're the whole like movement. The reason we move, the reason movement is a requirement is like, you've got all your, like the, if I asked you like, what does your cardiovascular system do? What, like, what's, what, what, what would you tell me? It's the same thing probably that everyone tells me. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. if I, it's like, Oh, you know, the heart and lungs are moving the oxygen around the body, but it doesn't really work that way. The oxygen, you know, you're breathing in the oxygen's getting into your lungs and it's getting into the main arterial system, but the oxygen isn't getting out of the arteries. It's not getting to the tissues that it feeds. It feeds through capillaries. So you, for, you know, if someone doesn't have a lot of anatomy or, or uh, physiology training, your blood network is like a, a circuit of sorts that has like the main arteries and veins, but then there's all these ones that branch off and they trickle all the way down until you've got a capillary. Every single one of your cells is about 10 micrometers away from a capillary. And and just for context, a micrometer is um, about half the width of one of your hairs. So your body's proliferated with all of these capillaries but the but the oxygen isn't getting out of the arteries into the capillaries so in order to get oxygen out of the main bloodstream and into the tissues that eat it right because it's all about cellular feeding the whole reason we the whole reason we move is to take an oxygen so that the oxygen can get to the tissues requires movement so if you only feed your cells one hour a day as opposed to feed them multiple times a day, it'd be the same thing as telling you, you can eat, you know, eat once or breathe. You know, if I told you, you're going to have to take, you're going to have to breathe for the day over a period of (laughs) one hour, you know, it's kind of stressful. It's kind of stressful and it is stressful to the body as well. And so that's why we've got all these kind of alerts, biological alerts that are going off because the, the amount of movement we're getting is very low. And so you're, you end up, the tissues are dying faster than you can regenerate. And that's essentially what disease is. Katie, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. You're literally blowing my mind. Like this is, this is, this are, is this like a movement I haven't, I mean, are you, are you on the brink? This is, this is big. I mean, this is, this is cool stuff because I've never thought about it that way, but it's, it's very true. I, cause you give the so many powerful analogies. You're making me think of the movie Wally. Have you seen this movie? Oh, I have. Yeah. Okay. So, but there's a couple things, right? Cause it gets it on both levels. One, people stop eating food and it's just like vitamins and feeding tubes. And we say like, Oh, you don't eat food anymore. You, like you said, you just, just take a vitamin. It's like the vitamin approach, the junk food, like junk movement. But in addition, they don't move anymore. And because they don't move, the body adapts to the demands you put on it. Like we all get that on some level. So right. their bones disintegrate. They just turn into these blobs, but we don't realize that just like the food we take in influences the makeup of our body. I, obviously when you take a step back, I had just never taken and that step back personally, how you move day in and day out is also applying stress to your body and your body responds to the stress that's put on it. And if we put on stresses in a way that is not the way that they were put on our body for hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, depending on your beliefs, clearly our body will react differently than it did during that time period. So there's the ancestral health movement. Why doesn't that include things like movement in the way you're talking about here? Cause it seems very ancestral. It seems very comparative. And in fact, in that community, there's more things like, like is CrossFit an example of this? Cause that's really popular in that community. Sorry, I'm rambling. You're getting me excited. That's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, and I would say that I do, I have a lot of followers, we call them followers, um, or people who are trying to learn about this, who do come from the ancestral health, because I'm definitely, 
using an envir- an evolutionary biology or ancestral health platform. So there is an element of, you know, if you don't, if that's not your thing, then then you could also just say, well, most people can understand. To, to, for me, the evolution of time or evolution of movement has happened. You know, you can start with the agricultural revolution if you want to go 10,000 years back, you know, which is kind of that whole fundamental paleo. It's like, okay, as soon as we stopped hunter gathering and, and started farming, that's a human transition. Um, then there's also closer would be the industrial revolution. And then even closer to that would be the technology revolution. So, so, you know, you and I are post industrial revolution because that's 250 years ago, but I thankfully am just past tech meaning that I didn't actually set my skeleton during the tech time, but people who are, you know, I'm 37, um, I'm 37. So kids who are like 17 now, their bones have been setting in a, an entire time where movement is even less than it was when we grew up. Now, compared to us growing up, compared to when everyone, like b- before industrial revolution, where people were still making a lot of their own stuff and and moving throughout the day, there's a shift there. And then of course, there's this giant shift between what nomadic populations are doing and what we're doing now. And I don't think that anyone is really looking at it. What, what I see in ancestral health is that the movement is not, the movement portion is not as radical as the food. Mm -hmm. So it, we're still stuck in this paradigm of exercise. And so are you familiar with a Venn diagram? I I am. Yes. Are you, are you the (laughs) Venn diagram (laughs) diagram guy? (laughs) So, um, if you imagine a Venn diagram, so you have this big circle on the circle, I put movement. So everything is movement. Anything that you do with your body that changes its position, whether to the ground or relative to itself, some part relative to itself is movement. But within the movement bubble, there are two sub bubbles. One bubble would be exercise and the other bubble would be natural movement. And so what's happening is people are looking to like, well, what are Katie, what are some more natural movements I can do for my workout? And I'm such a purist because I have to be, because this is basically my, this is my life's work. This is everything I've done scientifically. This will be my contribution, which is exercise is what's doing us harm. The whole concept of exercise is what's doing us harm. Not that there's anything wrong with movement, but exercise is a very specific thing. It's moving for the benefit of something um, where movement is just something that you do to to get through regular life. So it has a lot to do with the psychological of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations, the frequencies. If you're, if you kind of always think about it as like, I've got, I've checked off the box of moving today. Like unless you change your mindset and wrap it around an entire new paradigm, you're always going to be wondering why this little niggling thing in your body is not going away. It's like, well, your cellular feeding is off and it's a real specific way to feed. There's a real easy way to put yourself on a grid and see what you're feeding and what you're not. And then you have to slowly migrate towards, if I can use a pun there, migrate towards (laughs) hunter gatherer movement. Um, And I'm writing a bigger book about it. Um, It won't be out till next year because it is quite um, there's a lot of different ways you can implement it. So if you did a tour of my house or actually on my blog, there's a tour of my house. I don't have a lot of furniture in my home. I don't have any couches. I don't have any chairs. So what I'm trying to present to people, and I know it's like, I'm not really, I'm not really a, as crazy of a person as I sound right now. <laughs> um, it's just, it's kind of like, you're going, okay, I live in the real world. So it's like, yeah, I live in the real world and I know all this information. So what do I do? Like the sitting in a chair, you know, that was the big risk factor last year, sitting as a new smoking. Um, but, but what the research really didn't say, or what the media didn't tease out of the research is it's not the sitting that's like the smoking. It's the stillness in one position. That's the smoking. Mm. So when you don't position it that way, it's like, oh, sitting's a new smoke smoking. It's like, great, then I'll stand here while I work. And that has benefit. But it's kind of like the argument of like, you know, all accidents happen within 15 miles of your home, so you'll move. You know, it's it's you're, you're <laughs> you know, it's like the the point, the sitting the sitting wasn't the problem. It was that there's an adaptation on a cellular level that happens when the geometry of your body is repetitive. You actually harden the walls of your arteries that way. It has to do with, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the one minute 
one minute physics lesson. If you have a straight hallway, can you imagine that a straight hallway and your roll falls down the hallway? If I come along and I put a bend in your hallway and I'm rolling balls down the hallway, where is that ball going to hit now? The wall. It's going to hit the wall. So you've got all these blood cells in your blood. They have mass. They're going down your bloodstream and you've got a really beautiful way of um, branching arteries. So, so you've, you've got basically like a, a beautiful hemodynamic system, which is just a, the physics of water where the size of tubing changes so that there's never what they call turbulent flow you want everything very laminar. So if you're flying, you know, you want when you're flying in an airplane, you want as much laminar flow as possible. When it gets turbulent, it gets a little bumpy. So with turbulent flow in the bloodstream, what happens is it, it sends your blood cells crashing into the walls of your artery. And so that starts a wounding cycle. And then that wounding cycle leads to a, eventually a change, right? If you if you sit and if you've ever had a scab on your hand, you know, you can thicken the skin into a scar by just repeatedly picking at it. And what you're doing is you're actually changing the cell. You're changing the state of the cell. So the same thing happens with the epithelial cells that are inside your arteries. It's like if you're going to bombard them with physical pressure more so than I don't the what how it's designed is not really the most per perfect way to say it, but I, I say it for ease. Like more more than with a greater load than than the, the tissue can adapt to handle or evolve to handle, it just adapts by becoming thicker. But then that eventually, it's like a short-term adaptation. It's like, great, you're not going to tear a hole in your wall, so it becomes thicker. But the whole part of your pressure, blood pressure regulation system requires this elasticity. So adaptation, I think people are kind of confused when they hear adaptation because they think that it means improvement. An adaptation is a short-term change for short-term survival. It affects your ability for your body to work in the future so that it can work right now. So with natural movement or with a natural constantly fluxing um, geometry, you would never have this artery stiffening that does, in fact, um, it, starts to, it starts you down a cycle of a lot of cardiovascular issues. So it's all about change. It's all about variability. Even if you're like, I don't have time to fit natural movement in my life. It's like, instead of sitting on your couch, sit on the floor. That's change. That's a change all the way down to the geometry of your blood vessels. And so the more frequently you use different geometry, the less you're going to adapt to any one thing. Katie, you are awesome. <laughs> like this is just awesome. Like I, I just feel we've already gone way over time. I don't care because this is this is cool stuff. Like kudos to you for this work. I, I we're gonna have to talk again offline because this is just I'm a fan. I, I I haven't sat like this and just taken notes and been enamored by one of my guests in a really long time. So good kudos to you, madam. I just liked you on Facebook and and also followed you on Twitter. So you got at least one more fan on both groups. <laughs> And it only took me 34 minutes. <laughs> it, it totally scales. So if you could just do that, 30, well, no, obviously, <laughs> hopefully the listeners are also enjoying, enjoying you as much as I am, because this is fabulous stuff. And folks, obviously, uh, Katie is, is a brilliant woman and you can learn a way more about her as I am going to, as soon as the show ends at Katie says.com. And that's K A T Y S A Y S.com. And Katie, you actually just released a new book, correct? Yeah, alignment matters. And, it, and you're funny too. You are just, I'm just, you're just my new favorite person today. Good job, Katie. You are, you get an A plus for the podcast today. There, that's you and my dad. <laughs> <laughs> folks, uh, her name is Katie and she is awesome. Katie, tell folks just a little bit more about yourself, just really quickly, where you're from, what you're doing, what you're doing next, all that kind of fun stuff. Well, I am from everywhere. I like to think, um, I, you know, I, you can find me, you can find more, you can read everything you ever want to write about me. I started a blog, um, seven years ago. <laughs> I can't believe it's been that long. <laughs> um, Katie says.com. And it's just, it started as just a place where, um, some of the people I have a, a, a training for this, you know, where, um, I answered questions for people who've been to the training and it slowly like, evolved over time into, a place where I began to write more and more articles. And you can see the evolution of my writing and my thinking if you start at the, at the beginning. Um, and it, it's a lot more, a lot more heady now and a lot more of this kind of, I didn't start teaching out 
the cells part of it. You know, I started teaching more of the, the orientations because really as we talk about this level first, but where you should start in your body is this kind of understanding how to assess the parts of you that no longer move, you know, the, and that, and that's really what the best thing you can do for your health. And you can come, you can come stalk me online, come the Facebook page is a good place. Um, that's probably the align and well, Facebook page is where I spend most of my time. And I'm there a couple hours a day answering questions and just um, dishing out information such as this. That's awesome, Katie. Well, again, it's katiesays.com, K-A-T-Y-S-A-Y-S.com. Her name is Katie Bowman. Katie, thank you again so much for coming on the show. This has been awesome. We've got to have you back. Thanks, Jonathan. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's show as much as I did. Whew! I'm exhausted. That was a freaking good show. And remember, this week and every week after – Eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Chat with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff, like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely appreciate it. 